Hello, I'm Louisa Baldini, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's In Focus panel discussion on mental health and resilience for frontline workers, tools, approaches, and policies to help yourself and others. And this panel discussion is in partnership with Nursing Now. The success of mass COVID vaccination programmes, which will hopefully start next year, will depend on frontline workers. Yet we've been hearing more and more about the toll the pandemic's taken on that vital workforce, both physically and mentally. Indeed, there is talk of a mental health crisis among health workers marked by anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and even suicide. Nursing Now is focusing on aiding nurses and other health workers to both help themselves and help others. In this session, we will be hearing about the extent of the problem. We'll be discussing the importance of a workplace that encourages mental well-being, and we'll discuss policy approaches that will result in mentally healthy work environments. So let me introduce our panel. We're joined by Barbara Stilwell, who is Executive Director at Nursing Now. Hello, Barbara. We are joined also from Scotland by Dr. Marty Balam from the Edinburgh Medical School and Nursing Studies. We have Ruth Oshikanlu, a nurse, a midwife, an entrepreneur, and an author. We also have another author here on this panel, and that is Michael Rosen. Michael spent 40 days in an induced coma on a ventilator after falling ill with COVID. He is a, an award-winning poet as well as an author. Um, we will also hopefully shortly be joined by Howard Catton, who is the executive director at the International Council of Nurses. Uh, he can't join for a few minutes, but he will do as soon as he can. So, Michael, I wanted to start with you first. And, you know, as a, a family who have been a long time fans of one of your books were going on a bear hunt we were very sad to hear that you had fallen ill with covid and so seriously how are you doing now i'm okay i finished uh, i was in hospital in all for about uh, three months and i came out of rehab hospital uh, towards the end of june so here we are now and um I can walk about and um, I'm all right. I'm, I'm a bit feeble. I lost the sight, most of the sight in my left eye, uh, most of the hearing in my left ear, uh, have a problem with feeling in my toes um, and I'm quite weak. That's all I'd say, but I'm, I'm you know, it's, uh, it's progressing. So a victim of, of long COVID, but at least you are out of hospital and back home and, and back at work? Uh, yes, I mean, I, uh, I haven't returned to university where I teach uh, yet. Um, the BBC, where I do a radio programme, have just uh, taken me on again, which is nice. <laughs> they didn't say, oh, well, you know, you might as well shuffle off as you were ill. They were, didn't treat me that way at all. So they've recontracted me, which is lovely. Um, and I've been writing. So since uh, I came home, I've been writing plenty because uh, I had lots of good ideas while I was lying on my back in hospital. Well, I wanted to ask you about that time. Obviously, for a lot of it, you were in the coma, but for uh, the times when you were awake and lucid, has that experience changed your perception of nursing? Well, one thing in particular, actually, was when I wasn't conscious, because the nurses wrote, you may be familiar with this, but I wasn't, a patient diary. So every morning, um, having looked after me uh, through the night, uh, the nurse who, who had done that um, wrote a, a kind of letter to me telling me what they had done for me and with me through, through the night. And it's just a very simple page by page thing. But when I read it, I get overcome with emotion because it's so caring and so loving from complete strangers. I have no idea who any of these wonderful people are, and they're sometimes personal, sometimes very factual. Um, some of them, it's English is not their first language. And it is an unbelievable, wonderful document for me to have. 
Um, and I had no idea. I mean, I didn't even know what intensive care was. So to, the, the kind of care and attention that they paid to me is, is, is it's extraordinary. And so that in itself. And then in terms of their interactions with me when I became conscious, uh, it's amazing. I mean, just so caring and kind and efficient and so on. And so, some of them, as they point out, they, it's not wasn't their first job because it was an emergency. You had people who had come in, who had retired or um, would, had done other jobs and weren't usually on wards anymore. So it was a, a wonderful experience. And I would imagine that you couldn't have any family around. So that contact, contact with those nurses was absolutely vital for, for your morale. Yes, no contact sort of formally, but um, because it was difficult to get me out of the coma, uh, they wheeled me out, <laughs> uh, still with the drips and everything else on me, uh, onto the atrium outside the ward. And my wife came in with, uh, with a pad and played clips of our children and my older offspring. And apparently this was a game changer for me to come out of a coma. But that was um, thanks to the care of the doctors and nurses to say, well, we ain't going to wake him up any other way. They tried various other things like reminding me of which football team I support and things like that. But uh, this was the game changer. And then when I was in rehab, um, a wonderful um, ward sister, who I think came from Trinidad, she used to say, she used to say, I'm sure you want to see your Tweety Pie. And I, I thought, who's my Tweety Pie? Oh, yeah, my wife, of course. And she'd say, I think, I think, I think we can arrange it. And so what she did was um, got me to go out into the garden outside. So I was wheeled out in my wheelchair at that point. Um, and where I met my wife and our, our kids and my older offspring again. Um, and we sat outside uh, in, the, in the little garden. What wonderful uh, compa compassion and care that those nurses showed you and, and lovely to hear the patient perspective before we hear from the, the healthcare uh, workers and practitioners on this panel. Um, Michael, you are going to read a poem for us at the end. Which poem have you chosen and why have you chosen it? It's a poem called These Are The Hands, which I wrote for our National Health Service in, in England and Wales and Britain, totally, um, National Health Service. And uh, I didn't realise, but when I was in a coma, it was read out on the BBC and various other places. And I gather it's now up in certain hospitals. People have made posters. I think even in one hospital in Glasgow, they've carved it into the space underneath the stairwell. Um, and so uh, I, I want to do that. And it's a tribute to all health workers because, you know, as a patient, you come to realise more acutely than anyone else, perhaps that you're being cared for by cleaners, by catering staff, by window cleaners, by everybody, you know, cater uh, the, the maintenance people. You're cared for in a, in a global sense by all of those people. So I don't want to diminish anybody's work by saying that, but obviously different kinds of expertise. So it's a tribute to all of them. Well, Michael, we look forward to hearing from you um, with that poem shortly, but we'll now turn to some of the other uh, panellists. So don't go too far, Michael, will you? Um, Barbara, to you, um, you are executive director at nursing now. The situation for nurses and healthcare workers is unprecedented. Can you give us an overview of the main issues they're facing day to day? Yes, um, thanks, Louisa. Um, and it's great to have this opportunity uh, to interact with the WISH community. Um, yes, I think, you know, the thing we have to remember about health work is that it's hearts and minds. Um, obviously, we want health workers to be uh, well qualified, to be scientifically knowledgeable, to be able to use that science um, in the, you know, to keep people alive in the way that Michael's been so vividly talking about. But as he's also reminded us, it's also about hearts as well. Um, and really good medicine, good nursing that's focused on patients is really about making that emotional connection with people. It's all about emotional labor. And that, I think, um, for all of us is really what takes a toll. Um, 
And so what we're finding worldwide is that nurses are talking about feeling stressed and feeling burnt out and tired um, and just exhausted, I think, you know, running on empty because they've really put everything into this, uh, into caring for people during this awful pandemic. We've also heard that some nurses um, have been stigmatized by their communities. They've actually found well, apologies for the technical problems. This is day five of In Focus panels. We haven't had any problems any of the other days, but please do bear with us. We were hearing there from Barbara Stilwell, Executive Director at Nursing Now, about the stresses that nurses and healthcare workers are really suffering from. I wanted to turn now to uh, Marty Balaam, who is joining us from the Edinburgh Medical School and Nursing Studies. And Marty, there would be practical things that we could do to help nurses and, and healthcare workers. Um, for example, ensuring that their shifts don't go on and on and on and they're not working interminable hours. But what else can be done to help them and how can they help themselves? Well, as you say, it's, um, and hi, Louisa, and hi, Wish, and hi, everyone that's out there. It's, um, as you say, it's really important now that, and vital, in fact, that we give ourselves and others permission to recharge their batteries. And there's a number of ways that um, we can do this. And certainly with the healthcare professionals um, and nurses, this appears to not come naturally to all of us, because many of us are educated to put our patients first and are notorious for battling on in stressful situations, which is often detrimental to our own and others' well-being. And there's also a requirement day after day to be resilient, to provide reassurance and compassion to their patients. But I really believe that this strong sense of compassion now needs to be turned inwards as well. So there are a number of ways that self-compassion can help us um, through these times and moving forward is absolutely vital. Self-compassion is a very powerful tool for meeting our needs and helping us care for others. For example, if as nurses we are stressed by a busy, demanding shift, if we can acknowledge these difficulties that it is causing us, we're then able to look after ourselves with regard to this. And we can also see that those who are suffering often hurt others when we take out our unhappiness on other people. Therefore, living with compassion this way towards ourselves protects us and those around us, so then we are happier and calmer. But Marty, how can you actually instill self-compassion in, in the workforce? Well, we need to begin by being, um, start with ourselves, by being patient, kind and understanding when we fail or feel we are not doing the best we can. Teaching um, healthcare workers, professionals and ourselves that we are not always perfect and that we are indeed human rather than getting impatient or angry. This is one of the first steps to practicing self-compassion. Individuals really need to be tuned into how they are feeling and responding to situations on a daily basis. And one of the ways we can do this is by being kind, practicing forgiveness uh, to ourselves. You know, none of us are perfect. Life can and is difficult. And we need to start speaking to ourselves a little bit more kindly and saying things we would say to other people to ourselves. And also bringing in the things that we love, treating ourselves as close friends and realizing whilst we are in this storm together, we um, are in different boats and we all have a shared need for love and acceptance. So I, for me, it is a no brainer. You know, the science does tell us that compassion and self-compassion makes a massive difference to all our lives and that we really can have balance and equanimity despite what is going on around us in healthcare, in COVID and in our lives. And compassion and self-compassion is so very important for that. Thanks, Marty. And Ruth Oshikanlu, you talk about something called the chain of stress. What is it? Tell us a little bit more about that, please. Hi, Louisa, and hi, Rich community. Yes, I talk about that chain of stress because I've been a midwife for, and health sister for about 25 years. But it wasn't until I became pregnant I learned about vicarious or secondary trauma because... When we help others, sometimes because of the experiences supporting them, we can get traumatized as helpers. We use we employ a lot of empathy in our engagement with our clients, many of whom that have experienced stressful situations that can traumatize them. And that's why it's so important that we heal, because as we help others, we could get damaged 
too. And I'll give you an example. Up until the time 16 years ago when I got pregnant, I didn't know I had experienced any feelings. I didn't feel traumatized or there was any unresolved feelings. But up until that time, I had supported women who had four different women who had stillborn babies. And then during my pregnancy, I started to have all these flashbacks seen all these babies and it was then I realized I had feelings I had not processed I didn't realize this and that's why I ensure I embed it in my daily practice to ensure I explore my feelings around anything because what I do now is support those kind of women who are scared they may lose their babies and I don't want to project any feelings on them neither do I want to get traumatized by supporting them and enabling them to heal. And Bruce, what about um, when we think about nurses and healthcare workers in their pre professional capacities, but, you know, they are personal, private individuals as well, and they're sort of wearing two hats. Do you find that they struggle with that balance to sort of leave work behind when they go home and, and vice versa? In fact, that is so true. In fact, most of the um, clinicians I support now because of the pandemic, where our homes have become work, our workplaces, and we're supporting people who've experienced domestic abuse, child abuse, neglect, parenting challenges, financial problems. And normally you could dissociate home from the workplace, but we're bringing those things to their home environment. And we're humans first. We may be experiencing these problems too. So it's important that we process this to pro so support people to heal and uh, give them an opportunity to recharge their batteries, restore themselves so that we don't project these anxieties onto our clients that we support or get traumatized by, by them. Thanks very much for that. Well, we've been joined by Howard Catton, the Executive Director at the International Council of Nurses. But Howard, I'm not coming to you just yet. I just wanted to introduce you. Before I come to you, um, Barbara Stilwell, uh, I wanted to ask, this is, of course, a global issue. Mm -hmm. at, and throughout your career, you've been working to help health workers in isolated and or low income settings with limited resources. Do you think for them that uh, they have more resilience due to the circumstances uh, they work under all the time? Or do you think they will be more, more susceptible now, especially when it comes to mental health issues? <laughs> I think it's it's a bit of a two-edged sword. I think people who are working very difficult circumstances um, often adapt and, and sort of step up a bit like a wartime mentality. You know, we're all in this together. We're going to step up. We're going to work hard. And to a certain extent, that works. And you, we've seen that everywhere, really, during the pandemic. You know, we're all in this together. Um, we've all got to work together. The problem is... Um, that although uh, healthcare workers are quite rightly have been lauded as superheroes, actually we're not superheroes. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we're people, and you know superheroes don't need to go home and rest, and they don't need. They don't have families they have to worry about, and and you know they're not working from home and, and worrying whether their patients are okay. And I think there's a temptation, whether you're a health worker in like a remote clinic in Uganda or you're battling something here in, in London, um, that you think you are invincible mm. and you're not. Um, and, you know, that is it's very critical to sort of to recognize we don't need another hero. We need to be able to look after ourselves and to look after each other. That's what we really need to be doing. Barbara, thank you. Howard, now is executive director at the International Council of Nurses, which is a federation of more than 130 national nurse associations representing more than 27 million nurses. Can you outline the scale of the mental health problem that you're identifying from your members around the world? Um, thanks, Louisa, and hello, everybody. Um, we've never seen anything uh, like it. We went into this pandemic six million nurses short. That's one in five. You imagine if you went into your workplace and you were one in five colleagues short and the pressure and strain that that would 
cause. And then on top of that, you were asked to deal with the biggest challenge that you've ever been asked to do, in this case, the global pandemic. On top of that, you're worried about your own health and safety. We've looked at the data on infections and think that around 10% of health workers could be infected. Tragically, we know of 1,500 nurses who have died in 44 countries. The true figure will be higher. We only have the data from 44 countries. It's the same number of nurses we lost in World War I. The fact that that data isn't being collected, I think, is a real issue. Some of the deplorable attacks and abuse that we're seeing for people who are trying to give of their best and to help and support others bleach thrown on people just a few days ago in Wales, uh, verbal abuse to the nurses who were there, nurses who've had tenancies not renewed because landlords are worried about the spread of infection, difficulty accessing child care as, as well. So this, you know, the pressures and the demands are huge. And it's got so bad that we've heard reports in the last few days in Belgium, in the US, of nurses who are COVID positive but asymptomatic being asked to go into work. I am sensing a mood change though as well. I, I'm having a lot more nurses who are saying to me, enough with the applause. We want to see action, act, don't clap. And we want to see real practical um, actions to support us. There are disputes, there's unrest, there are strikes in some countries as, as, as well that we're seeing. And uh, Howard, then what can be done? You know, what can yeah. you do, for example, at the International Council of Nurses to set up systems that can support nurses in places where their own healthcare systems or governments are not providing support? Uh, so uh, this year we've had the first ever State of the World's Nursing Report and it had a really simple strap line, uh, invest in education, jobs and leadership. Um, but it requires investment in all of those things. But there are also some very practical things, I think, at a, the level of, a, of a, a health service provider. At the start of the pandemic, uh, because of the demands, lots of leave was cancelled, understandably. But you can't sustain an approach like that. You need to give people time uh, time out. Where are the occupational health services? Where is the counselling services? Um, and there's a really important culture issue within organisations, not only to say I'm not OK and that not to be seen as a weakness, but for organisations to also, if nurses are being, if, the, if they're raising concerns and criticisms, they're not slapped down and they're not made to feel as though they're being unpatriotic to their own organisations. And I would like to see leaders, you know, when we see some of these awful attacks and abuse that have happened, come out very clearly and condemn it and to take a zero tolerance uh, approach so there are some you know there are some examples of some practical things that that leaders at a local level can do uh, as well as the bigger piece around investment wouldn't it be great if the g20 leaders this weekend talked about not only what they need to do together to protect the world from covid and to invest in our health for the future but made commitments about share of gdp spend on health in the future because i think but it's, it's obvious we've not spent enough on on health because of the state that we find ourselves in so leaders Lead, leaders from those nurses who are running teams uh, in a hospital or clinic through to the people who are going to meet around the G20 lead, uh, table all have a role to play in my view. Thanks Howard. Ruth, did you want to comment on that? Yes, and locally too, we want leaders who would take responsibility for their staff. Carers need care too. In fact, there's so much evidence to show that the more cared for professionals are, the better care they give to those they serve. So it's so important to embed things like compassionate and clinical re uh, restorative supervision, supporting uh, clinicians to put their oxygen mask on first so they can better able serve others. Barbara? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Louisa. I, I also just want to reinforce that point and to say particularly that nurses have never been very good at um, speaking outside of nursing to ask for what they want. And this is what we have to learn to do much better. Um, both Howard and Ruth, I think, touched on this. But what is our ask? You know, if we're going to say to politicians, invest in nursing, invest in health care, invest in health systems, what do we want them to invest in? And so we've got to be a lot slicker at getting that evidence out there. How can we build back better um, from what we've been through this time? 
Do you think there's a concern that, that future health workers are going to be put off joining the caring professions if they continue to see this strain that nurses and healthcare workers are, are, are put under? Who would like to jump in? I, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd, let me just jump in, if I may, Louisa, because I think it's a really important um, issue. For me, uh, the, the jury's out on this one. Um, from some countries, uh, we see um, an increased interest in the nursing profession. People who have, you know, if you're looking for a meaningful career where you can make a difference to people's lives, then look no further than nursing. Those of us who are nurses have known that, that but, but many, many others are. And there's an interest. But at the same time, the picture that I painted about what the reality of nursing is like uh, really worries me that it could be a turn off, not just for new recruits, but also the impact on the retention of the staff that we currently have. I hear a lot of nurses who say, look, when we threw this, that's it, I'm done. I've given as much as I can. I know I need to help us through this, but I'm, I'm gone and I'm out of here. And I think that we I think there is a real possibility that we could lose a lot of uh, our experienced nurses earlier than we would otherwise have done at the end of this pandemic. And we need to focus as much on the retention piece as we do on future recruitment. Uh, and Howard, I mean, it may seem obvious to some, but if you could just spell out what would the implications be of not acting to address these issues? Uh, look, uh, you know, people talk about we must strengthen health systems we must invest in 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 health we put it very very simply uh, our hospitals our clinics our healthcare facilities without staff are empty buildings health is people the people who receive it but the people who give it as uh, who give it as well and what we're so not only would we then see without the staff um people uh people not getting the care and treatment the recovery uh the support the stabilization all of those things but what the pandemic as we all now know so clearly and vividly is the relationship between our health the our economic well being um, the vibrancy of our communities and perhaps you know most perhaps most importantly something that we often take for granted is just being with people being with our family our friends our loved ones and our neighbors and covid has has robbed us of of that for this period if we if we want those economic we want economic prosperity we want to have those vibrant relationships we want to have cohesive uh, communities nurses health systems are a best buy Yes, although all too often people sort of take them for granted, don't they? Why is that? Oh, I, I, I think that I think there's I think there's um, uh, there's one aspect to this which is um, which is rooted in um, the gender issue around nursing being a female dominated profession that people value it for its care and its compassion, but haven't valued it economically. Um, and I think that nursing as well has also perhaps not been bold enough to talk about the business case for nursing, to make these arguments about the relationship between care and economies and the other things that we that we value. To talk about, you know, if we are if we're investing in prevention, the savings that that is for health systems as well. And, 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 and in many ways, it is. people don't don't go into nursing to monetize or to commodify what it is that they are they are doing and that's the last i wouldn't want nurses uh, who are care for us to, to, to for that to be at the forefront of their minds but i think you know organizations like icn and, and advocacy from nursing now and national nursing associations we have to put nursing into that language to get the political traction that we uh, that, 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 that we need to see to get that change in mindset around uh, around investment. And do you think there should be more emphasis on mental health uh, yeah. provision then for nurses? Because it, it is it is expected that they are undertaking or a traumatic job, and that's before even situations like COVID. So is there enough to help them? I mean, Marty spoke of uh, compassion, self-compassion, and nurses really needing to understand that and bring that into their day-to-day -day lives. But is that enough? Should more be done to help them? Uh, look, I th one of the things that, that, that this pandemic has exposed is, is where our health systems have been 
uh, have been been weak. You know, we've not invested much in in, in social care and in, in care homes, and mental health is right the, is is right there. Chronic and persistent underfunding in mental health, and actually mental health services, the end shows have been cut as a result of this pandemic. At the very time that the demand for mental health services is going uh, through the roof, the provision is 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 cut shorter. Nurses are. Um, one of the things, that I, one of the things that I think that we also may well see, I hope to see as a result of this pandemic, is a change in the mindset about health services away from sickness services of diagnosis, treat, go into a hospital, doctor knows best, to thinking about prevention and well uh, and well being, um, and that. That approach, that holistic approach, the physical mental health approach, thinking about how I support someone so that you as the person who I'm working with to provide care, get the advice, information, support. You make decisions about your health care. I'm there as an enabler, as a facilitator. That's the, that's the essence of what nursing is all about. So I actually think there's a, there's a flip in the mindset about the philosophy of care and what it's there to, uh, what it, what it's there to achieve. And, and I mean, Barbara, you know, knows this so well from the, you know, the Sir Nigel Crisp's latest book as well, I think absolutely uh, about, you know, uh, health starts at home and hospitals, are, uh, you know, just for a fix, knows this very, very well. Uh, Howard, uh, thanks for that. You said nurses have, uh, have told you enough with the applause. Barbara, you've said uh, we shouldn't be looking at nurses and healthcare workers mm -hmm. as being heroes. So what do you make then? Do you welcome the fact that the World Health Organization has announced next year to be the year of the healthcare worker? Do you think it, that is, though, the right thing to do? Yeah, I think it's, uh, yes, it's great to have an opportunity to recognise uh, what health, all health workers do. It's not only nurses, it's doctors, you know, the whole team um, to recognise what they do. And this year, has been the, the year of the nurse and the midwife, although we have not noticed as much as perhaps we would have done. Um, I mean, ironically, we've noticed them a lot, but you know what we were going to do to celebrate has been slightly muted, I think, by the pandemic. Um, yes, we need to go on recognising them, but I'm absolutely with Howard on this. What we need is to be valued for the value of the work that's being done by everybody in the team. And, you know, without one member of the team, the team will fall apart, no matter who that is. So that's why we need to value each other um, and support each other, but also to be making the case to the Ministry of Health, wherever we live, you know, that, as, that without the people, there will be no health system. It simply will not run. So people are critical. Barbara, thank you very much. Well, we're going to have to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but we have yet to hear from Michael Rosen, of course. Some very welcome thoughts and, and recommendations there for workers and for countries everywhere that are trying to continue routine health service uh, while dealing with the worst of the pandemic, which is still not letting up, of course. Uh, so before we close with Michael Rosen's poem, I'd like to thank the panel, Barbara Stilwell from Nursing Now, Howard Catton from the International Council of Nurses, Dr. Marty Balam from the Edinburgh Medical School and Nursing Studies, Ruth Oshikanlu, a nurse, midwife, entrepreneur and author. And so Michael Rosen, poet and author, would love to hear the poem that you can now share with us. Thank you so much. These are the hands that touch us first. Feel your head, find the pulse, and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin, change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, soothe the saw. Burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw out sharps, design the lab. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can. Clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose and touch us last. Michael Rosen, thank you very much indeed. A poem there 
indeed a poem there for nurses and healthcare workers everywhere a very beautiful and poignant way to end this last in focus panel of wish 2020 i'm louisa baldini thank you to everybody for joining and watching today thanks thank you everybody